So my research group is located in the National Center of Excellence NCE building on the UBC campus attached to the MSL. And my team is largely a group of biophysicists. And we're very excited to be bringing single molecule and single cell resolution to the field of oligotherapeutics and vaccines. So Enmin and folks in this audience are very excited about developing new classes of nanomedicines. And as we know, the pandemic has really enabled rapid acceleration of these medicines. And in the course of that, there's a lot of opportunity to look at that data at much higher resolution, follow single particles, their entry in cells targeting the tissue, and at the single particle level, really understand biophysical mechanisms of how these work. Um, and so that, that's how we fit in the nanomedicine um, center. So the motivation and research questions in our group are really around mechanism. Um, we are known for developing a single molecule platform that allows us to trap molecules or particles, such as the lipid particles containing mRNA in little wells, and look up into this field of view at high resolution, look at many copies of them, so that we can understand their structure, their dynamics, correlate that with therapeutic activity, and do that at very high resolution. So we have developed um, some instrumentation which mounts on a converted microscope, very high powered microscope, that lets us see many copies of these particles. And I'm gonna talk about the development of, of those imaging techniques. And in the context of the Enman Center, I'm really gonna focus my talk on our results, which are collaborative with Peter Collis and folks like Jay and Dom that we know in his group and uh, have a new uh, collaborative student with Peter called Yao, who's, who's carrying on that legacy. And really the end goal is to do collaborative research to advance the field of nanomedicines by looking at these very fine scales and kind of make sense of findings that are racing ahead in the field. So the images and the results that I'll show throughout uh, my talk from this collaborative research were taken using uh, this device. Uh, we call our technique convex lens induced confinement, and it works by doing something a bit unusual. We're actually taking a curved surface, which we make by bending glass into contact with a flat surface. And we use glass because it's very, very smooth, sub nanometer smoothness. So we can push these right into contact so that little wells really isolate single molecules without leaking. And we have very low background because glass has very low autofluorescence. And so this little device here, if you zoom into the center, is literally bending one thin sheet of glass into another in which we have fabricated these little wells or other kinds of features. Um, we call the technique click or convex lens induced confinement. Initially, uh, I just put a curved lens on a surface to trap the molecules and got much higher quality imaging than our other methods and then develop this into a flow cell because of course, part of bioanalytics is to do things at scale. So the idea is that we can look at hundreds, thousands or millions of molecules in a sealed flow cell by repeatedly deflecting and trapping the samples. Um, so the technique that we've developed is also patented um, in the spirit of, of Enmin. One of the important things and for the trainees is to develop uh, intellectual property. So we have three active patents now and a few more um, in review. And this is really around our analytical platform of looking at the nanoscale of trap molecules in a thin slit, applications to nanoparticle analytics and other analytics. And also there's a miniature version of this that's built on a two millimeter chip that could really enable transformative scale. So if you're curious about that, I have the list of patents there. But I'm really going to focus on the application today to nanoparticle imaging and our results. Um, so we do a lot of engineering, microfabrication, and microfluidics. And in the end, what we're really interested in are those single particle properties. So if you've uh, followed where, where this has come from, this new application to nanomedicines, 
our background um, has included applications to polymer physics. Uh, we're very fascinated how DNA structure influences interactions. We've started collaborations where we use a nano confinement to regulate shape of DNA, which could be used, for example, in translocation through a nanopore genomic mapping. We've published on using the applied confinement really at the submolecular scale to control rates and chemistry. But really where I'm going to focus today and was perhaps the clearest application to biology is to use this just as a passive approach to trap many copies of single molecules, particles, or cells without tethers and with single molecule or single fluorophore uh, resolution. So we have publications on uh, some protein interactions, droplets, phase transitions, and others, if you're curious to think more beyond this talk. So in terms of uh, using our, our technology in the lab, it's very um, practical. We can simply pipette the sample into our little flow cell. It's always nice in these talks to make things a little more tangible before we get into the data, which is a more abstract. Um, but you can see how we can pipette the sample in. This is a picture of a hand holding our little flow cell. The array of uh, microwells is at the center of the flow cell, which is a little bit um, out of focus there, that square. And then conceptually, this is just a very simple way to trap a large array of molecules. And uh, one thing you may know is we recently moved across the country from Montreal to Vancouver um, to rebuild at the, the Michael Smith and Physics Department here, a close connection with people like Peter Collis and the local biotechnology community at PNI Acutis, really be in the thick of development. And uh, this proudly is the first video we took of click imaging after our move, which is significant to us. And this is fluorescently labeled DNA plasmid, so it'll be a few color base wide coiled up and being loaded in wells. So that's quite heroic to be on the other side of the pandemic with our new lab up and running. Yeah, and just in terms of sharing our purpose, we, we are very interested in characterizing these RNA medicines. And as Gilbert Walker mentioned in the building here, um, we're quite focused on that. So the influence of structure and interaction is paramount. So tethering molecules or particles is really not such a great option for us. We want to trap molecules and connect these very high resolution uh, observations in cell-like environments where the environments look like, more like this, they're very crowded and complex to uh, those in cells. And so tethering is not an option for us. And instead we have created a virtual environment to, to really pioneer things like uh, the impact of chemical modifications or mismatch or structure on interactions. Um, so before I get into our work with Enmin, I, I did want to paint a bit of a broader picture of what we're doing. So I'll just briefly mention that we have a few papers in nucleic acids research. If, uh, some of our audience or online in, audience are uh, interested in structure activity relationships in DNA. This is a project with David Levins at the National Cancer Institute and Craig Benham at UC Davis, where they have previous results in the onset of cancer of uh, spontaneous unwinding of target sites and transcription. Um, and so we're doing parallels of deep single molecule studies with a model of coiled DNA where we really investigate the role of higher order structure, sequence, uh, crowding, uh, modifications to binding of probes to that target site. And as we build this up, we found some very fascinating results that really indicate the importance of considering cell-like crowding agents on these DNA interactions. And a long-term impact of this work could be to do very high resolution uh, screens of, for example, topolysomerized drugs. So we can connect the fundamental biophysics of DNA interactions on the one hand, what's not known mechanistically, all the way up to helping you with therapies. And that's part of our move of bringing the physics to the MSL in this community. And the second branch of my work um, is not yet published, but we've actually really been doing quite a bit of technology development and does relate to the talk today. We've developed the ability uh, over the past few years to track single drugs and targets. So now, not just looking at the DNA substrate and probes that bind, uh, but actual antisense oligo, which is a short modified DNA drug, and actual mRNA target. And we had to image very fast to do this. 
So we're imaging like a, a millisecond per frame on the camera. And this is just a simple video of one drug and one target trapped in a well diffusing around. But what it means is that we can do very detailed studies of on rates and off rates that are really not accessible by standard methods like TM melting temperature or SPR in bulk. We can get kind of distributions of conformational states by adding a technique called CRET. Very detailed studies of the influence of mismatch, chemical modification, higher order structure, which we found to have a huge role on this. Um, so we can distinguish kind of the freely diffusing guys and the bound molecules. And um, an additional thing that, that we've developed is uh, for the imaging folks out there, we've set up these wells on a confocal microscope, which enhances our signal to noise even further and allows us to characterize these rates. And then on this project, what we're currently working towards is not just the on, onboarding of the duplex and its stability, but also the catalysis of cleavage of RNA and H. So this is something we've been working on collaboratively between my lab and a startup, which is, uh, carries our IP and has the potential for, for serving industry in the future. But just as a first step in that direction to gauge interest, we've been able to collaborate with IONIS or thought leaders in this area and really begin to do this very mechanistic deep research, which we hope to uh, publish as we develop. Um, but this, this is very exciting for me. It's a transition from fundamental DNA biophysics to real applied research, actual drugs. Um, so that's something we, we look forward to bringing to the field as we can further disclose it, but it's been a very active branch of our applied work for a couple of years. And now I'm gonna shift to what we're doing in nanomedicine network. And of course the tools I just shared would be illustrative of what we can do at the molecular level after the lipid particle deliverates mRNA. But today we're going to focus on that delivery aspect of the RNA medicine and high resolution characterization of the lipid particles containing the RNA. So there are several characterization workflows that are used in vaccine or genetic medicine development, such as characterizing size, uh, payload, understanding dynamics, entry in cells, and some of the dynamics associated with that, such as capturing the endosome release of the RNA translation. But it, I was just at a vaccine analytics conference. I was invited to speak last week in San Diego at a hybrid industry academic meeting called Pep Talk. And I, I think, you know, if there were people presenting both on the front lines, developing new vaccines, uh, people, you know, doing different characterizations such as dynamic light scattering of size or nanopore-based methods. Or, there's really this arsenal of techniques out there. But um, one of the things that we're very conscious of in our lab is that the time evolution of these complex lipid particles containing RNA can make the data a bit confusing. So what we're trying to contribute is an imaging platform where we literally image the particles diffusing around their actual size the dynamics fusing to one another, and then their entry in cells, targeting in tissues, all kind of in one room with a series of microscopes back to back. And that exact sample could also, for example, with partners like DNA or QDIS, be uh, transfected in mice. So it, it's quite possible that one could eliminate um, problems in quality control by quantitative imaging of the important characteristics really quickly. That's kind of the vision of what we're building up. And I'm gonna walk through our progress where we're already coming across many fascinating properties of these particles that we didn't expect. Um, one of which is their dynamics and fusion after manufacturing. So there's just one example, you know, size, you make a measurement. When is that size measured, right? When it's made, later, is it stable? Um, so that, that's the inspiration of quantitative imaging as well. Okay, so to, that's a big goal <laughs> and we're working on it in steps. So I'm gonna talk about the first piece of our work, which is uh, published in ACS Nano in fall 2021. And this reflects our collaboration with Peter Close since 2018, 2019 when we met during the sabbatical. So the first uh, step to apply our click technology to lipid particles was not so straightforward. We needed to actually develop very nice coatings for these glass uh, low background surfaces that 
didn't lead to the lipid particles tracking to uh, sticking, sorry, to the wells. So I won't go into too much detail on that, but that turns out to be quite challenging, but we've overcome it. The second um, challenge is really to interpret your analysis. So I would say there are probably a lot of publications out there which track particles where the reported diffusion coefficient and size are incorrect. Um, and that's because the data, you could imagine if you image faster or slower, you might get a biased result. So we uh, have mathematicians, physicists on our team who develop the theory of diffusion and the modeling of particle tracking in this new confined geometry running, say, computer simulations that you see on the right here of our data for a model system, say a polystyrene bead that's the same size as a lipid particle. So that, you know, there's an expression, if it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So if we can run a simulation of a model particle of 50 nanometers and its trajectory, make an image of what it should look like in our microscope, taking into account noise, short exposure, all of those very important details. And then see that if we do a control with say 50 nanometer polystyrene beads in the well, we get exactly the same kind of image. This, this kind of rigor was really important in optimizing what exposure number of frames illumination we use and eliminating bias. So in developing a new method, this kind of quantitative handle is very important. And so we are able to achieve that and that's also shared in our publication. We do load at a, a fairly low uh, number of particles per well so that we get some individuals given by Poisson statistics, track their very long trajectories. And I'll just make the point that even though the diffraction limit on this microscope is something like 100 nanometers per pixel, 150 nanometers per pixel, the length of the track and the ability to do sub-pixel resolution of the center means that the resolution on the size is really quite a lot smaller. So for example, I showed earlier in this talk a very fast image of a single molecule whose size is around one or two nanometers fit by the diffusion trajectory. So we can resolve that and we can resolve small differences in the diffusivities of these particles. Um, so that is something that took us a couple of, of years. And the way we track the particles leads to a fit for what's called the mean squared displacement. Um, you can think of that as the area it fills, which saturates uh, because the wells are finite. You know that in free space, the slope of this in two dimensions, the effective variance of the, of the trajectory goes as four times the diffusion coefficient times the loss time. And then the, the noise and the correlation gets larger at longer time lengths we have very precise fits under confinement. So that led us to the first uh, series of control experiments. And um, for these, we used uh, lipid particles, which are stained with uh, dyes, or DID, DII dyes, which are standard in the lipid particle literature with a lot of background from the color stuff. And two examples. So we used the Onpatro formulation, because at, at that time, um, historically, yeah, the first lipid particle RNA therapy that's released is on Patro um, by l -Nylum. And so that's the relevant one to work with. And it has a very low dosing of dye, something like 10 dyes per particle. And we checked that the dosing does not impact the result. Um, we're able to um, compare two situations. So on the right-hand side, this is a situation where we have a low amount of dye around the edge of the particle. And then on the left-hand side, this is a situation at lower pH, a more acidic pH, where the uh, particle was actually expected to be uh, not unilamin, like on the right, but uh, have two bilamin. So uh, this particle size is you know, typically around 50 nanometer region. So the dye is starting to fill the volume. So if, if you did have a situation just as a thought experiment with all the dye perfectly on the surface, and if you track every particle and its intensity, the scaling on a log-log plot, if that goes as r squared, the surface of the particle, would have a slope of two. Now on the left, um, the because some of this dye is hypothesized to be inside the particle, and um, Peter Paul's group in collaboration with the Cryo-M facility at UBC uh, can run these Cryo-M pictures, which are done differently with the surfaces frozen. Um, with the samples frozen on the surface, they do indicate a kind of thicker layer 
I'm looking at the cross section of the scattering of these particles. You can see they're very heterogeneous. Um, so that is consistent uh, with the slope being higher than two. For example, if you did have a sphere full of dye, the slope would be three. So between two and three is seems to be reasonable. This is also a very high resolution way in solution without, without disturbing them um, to look at homogeneity. So it's hypothesized that, um, and it's something that really has to be optimized in, in industry and manufacturing quality control that there is always an optimal size for the particles. So if one could, you know, we imagine in the future measure the homogeneity from the spread and size very well, and with a microfluidic device, possibly select the optimal non-aggregated particles through one channel, which should be straightforward to adapt here. I think this could be quite, um, quite a significant contribution. Um, and then the next natural step, of course, is to add this stain to the drug, the RNA, to count size and loading, which I'll show in the subsequent size, whereas here we're just looking at the diffusion. Um, so, here, what we did is we have a labeling as a demonstration and uh, investigating our capacity to do that um, of siRNA in, in the liquid particle. So this is again the impatro formulation, and we have um, yeah I guess very sensitive microscopes and devices and analysis that we worked hard to develop so that we can really see one dye per molecule. So the example on the top here is that the siRNA has on average one dye. In, in the liquid particle. And um, what's shown in the graph A here is that as you shine the laser, so a dye molecule emits light. That's what's being detected on the camera as it's diffusing around, very sensitive uh, detection. But actually when you shine enough laser or light at these dyes, they, they photo bleed, which is to say that they don't interact rhythmically with the laser. Anymore. That's useful because you can basically use these steps check that they're aligned with the background to then count how many uh, RNA payload are in, in the particle. So we repeated that many times for many particles and assemble a distribution of intensities for a single dye and intensities per particle, which allows us to get a number distribution of loaded sRNA drug per particle. And um, titrating that, um, or the Paulus folks prepared samples for us at different number of loadings, um, we were able to uh, fortunately yeah, quantitate the loading in a way that agreed with the anticipated uh, preparation. So this is a, a technique that can then be directly applicable, which is what we're working on now to covalently labeled mRNA. Um, siRNA are different. There's hundreds of these very short uh, RNA per lipid particle. But the mRNA, as you know, are many kilobase. So they're actually large polymers. So the counting for that is on the order of zero, one, two, three, there's actually hypothesis and published work last fall that, you know, half these vaccine particles are unloaded. So um, this, this technique demonstration is a, a step towards that application on the on Patra formulation. And then the next thing we did is ran a blind sample um, where we didn't know how, um, yeah, the particles would be uh, loaded in, in the liquid particle. Um, how the sRNA would be loaded in, in the liquid particle. And, and this, this was the Ampatro sample itself. And we measured this same correlation diagram. So every point on the curve is the intensity and the diffusion coefficient. And we were thinking, you know, we didn't expect and we weren't provided the cryo EM uh, picture of this sRNA uh, loaded Ampatro simulation. We, we didn't really expect results to come out this way. And we measured this sort of boring looking blob a lot of times before we reported it with our friends. But essentially, um, it looks like from this curve that we're not seeing many points along a slope of two or three line. This, in fact, looks like uncorrelated data. Um, so what, what we concluded is, you know, the siRNA are not you know, on the outside of the lipid or uniformly filling the particle. They're instead uncorrelated. And the cryo EM pictures that came back um, kind of look that way. You see these little nuggets of siRNA structure uh, in the liquid particle. So that's to say, for example, if you have a bigger particle, it could have a larger nugget or a smaller nugget. In other words, the uncorrelated data at the center of this graph is reasonable, which is not, not what we expected. I mean, you would have thought this line would just go up on some slope before you really thought about it. And, and it's just true um, that in general, you know, why the lipid particles encase the RNA, why they're stable, 
what structures they take and how that influences their uptake in cells, trapping the endosome, release, degradation is not well understood, but given that there's so much room for optimization and, and excellence in these therapies, we're just taking the first look here and I think we have a lot to contribute over time. So that's the first piece of my um, presentation on size and loading and kind of sharing with you the journey of developing that in a bit more detail in a short talk. And now I'm um, gonna get into some of our unpublished results where we're super excited. Uh, we have one from in our move, the CFI, as well as the Western Division of Economic Growth in Canada, microscopes that allow us to take our measurements that we developed in single particle in cells and tissues. And the questions that we're interested in, I mean, the whole field is interested in, so now we can track these particles in, in our blast cells, but also we can apply these same tools in, in live cells. We're interested in the dynamics, fusion against each other, fusion against the model endosome as they put down from cells. We want to follow and count the uh, LNP and mRNA in the endosome versus the cytosol. We want to track their capture, release, degradation, and the subsequent protein expression. And we have quantitative assays that we're setting up to do back-to-back -back in cells and with high throughput. So we really captured the interest of you know, industry partners in that as well as academic colleagues to connect fundamental mechanism and these detail to the, the work that's being at the, done at the front, front lines of the vaccine therapy development. So I do think dynamics are really important. Um, to comment on what we're seeing right now, we're looking at particles post-manufacture. And I mean, when, when they're just stored in a tube, they're fusing with each other. And um, anyway. Here in, in these experiments, we're studying fusion at high resolution. If we trap particles, say, half labeled in red, half labeled in green, in wells, and follow them individually, over time, we can use that same technique called FRET, where we see energy transfer between the dyes to count uh, the number in each you know, unfused species versus fused species and their size. We've taken quite a lot of data in the past six to nine months since we've been fully operating again in Vancouver. And there's quite beautiful data. So instead of trapping single particles in wells, we really want to understand the influence of structure and, and uh, formulation on, on fusion, both from the manufacturing perspective and from later considering the path in the cell. So we trap a bunch of these particles, say some in green, some in red in wells. And then well by well, we take the movie of, of their fusion. And so this kind of gives you a visual representation of our data or very quantitatively we fit this fusion curve for every well. And we've been exploring with Peter and his group, um, you know, as a function of pH, different preparation conditions, and so on. This is uh, important to, to the field. And this is just gives you kind of a taste of our data. So we're seeing some, some very clear uh, trends. So just to talk about them briefly, this is a this particular set of data follows the first. Paper and it's also using the Empatro formulation um, since that's really the anchor in, in the field. But as a function of the loading um, here of siRNA, we are seeing um, higher drug loading resulting in lower fusion activity. Um, as a function of running at higher concentration, I guess as you would expect, higher concentration results in higher fusion activity. And each dot here is a single particle trajectory. So you can see these clear clusters. And we started to investigate um, the role of PEG, which is, of course, um, a common ingredient in, in therapies and vaccines, and higher PEG uh, lipid concentrations, resulting in lower fusion activity. So I think uh, dynamics is really important from a manufacturing perspective, but also in thinking about the path in the cell and all the kinetic steps that could be limiting. Um, so this is sort of a demonstration. And then in, um, what's currently going on yeah, in that data collection, oops, um, is that with Yao and uh, Albert and Yifei, um, who folks from the nano medicine community are familiar with, they are running these experiments right now for quite a range of uh, parameters shown here and also uh, the pH trajectory. And uh, we recently almost completed a parallel cryo-EM run and uh, DLS run. Um, using that same matrix of samples. And we're, we're looking forward to sharing that um, with the field. So that's been one of the main projects we've been working on, or two projects with Edmund uh, since being here. 
Um, the second is to look at the vaccines um, themselves. And so preliminarily, um, this is a video, this is work that's in progress, I guess this video is not the highest resolution, but um, what's, what I'm showing here in this grid is uh, a first step towards characterizing the payload in the vaccine particles, where the mRNA is actually labeled with a dye called ribogreen, which is a standard a dye in, in the field. It's a sort of suboptimal dye to use because it interpolates along the mRNA and probably has some impact. But just to train our, our methodology, um, so this, this video starts with lipid particles labeled in red and mRNA labeled in green and they're intact. You will wait, wait for it to loop again. So we're looking in, in red and green channel overlaid. We see them nicely intact. And then actually what we've done here, just as an illustration, is flown in the lysis buffer. This is a visual illustration. And we see the big mRNA polymer actually release. So I just wanted to show you this point that, yeah, the nuggeted particles that fuse around in red, that they contain this bundled up huge uh, polymer, right, that freely diffusing is much bigger than the particle itself. Um, so um, Preliminarily, what we're seeing is that a lot of the, uh, like half or some decent fraction of the vaccine formulation, I and mean, we're studying this in detail with different formulations, but just to make a qualitative statement, it does seem to be the case that many particles are unloaded. And biophysically, it makes sense because the polymers are being packed as large mRNA in the vaccine, it's large. And then this sort of lysis uh, video it proves the point. It, the, the green polymer is packed in little red particle at the beginning, and then you lice sort of explodes and fills the field of view. But right now, what we're doing in the lab is uh, looking at Moderna, Pfizer, and uh, Apache formulation with a specific mRNA we've been able to get <laughs> uh, so far. And we want to do very, uh, yeah, we're doing very careful just characterization of payload per particle. And that, of course, is uh, not, not accessible in bulk because we, we can see how many particles are empty, how many are full, and that full, full distribution with single particle resolution. Um, and yeah, that is something that we're looking at now in real time. And so let's see, how are we doing on time? Not too bad. Um, so yeah, to allow some time, some time for questions, I guess I can work towards wrapping up. So I hope what you've taken away from this talk is that these very quantitative single particle measurements, for example, of size, loading, there are dynamics going on in manufacturing, a fundamental relationship between fusion and activity is not well understood and the role of structure in that. So you know, at the single particle level, we're investigating that. And just knowing the payload of how many mRNA per vaccine particle, tweaking formulations to optimizing it, possibly building microfluidic chip to then sort in real time could be a nice contribution to the field. And then what's being set up uh, this month and next month in my lab is one of these microscopes has arrived and one of them keeps <laughs> being uh, delayed, I guess, COVID ship shipping issues, but we're setting up to track single particles. Uh, we've done the in vitro demonstration on the new microscope, but uh, as soon as we yeah, have a person dedicated to this, we can follow them in cells. Uh, basically, we'll be able to follow the particle and the payload in two channels in real time, see the localization of the intensity in the endosome, ask questions about how much is in the endosome versus the cytosol and degradation and release. And we'll also be able to, if we use something like a luciferase or a GFP, look at the expression. And of course, this should all be, this will all be collaborative with uh, therapies and vaccines that are developed by biovers who are leading the in translational work. Um, so the contribution of this kind of work is really the mechanism optimization, biophysical understanding. You know, one could imagine that if most of the particles are empty right now, we could lower the dose by a factor of two or 10, probably have a long way to go, um, given that the pandemic really accelerated work with quite a lot of room for optimization. And then this is the schematic. Um, of what's coming, we have an automated tissue handler to help us uh, really increase the throughput of work in cells and tissues. And then in addition at the single particle level, um, from our 
formulation um, partners, uh, they'd really like us to look at, you know, hundreds of samples at a time, not three or five. Um, so we, we put in a proposal to the end of phase four to scale that up in partnership with engineers at the BC Cancer who are super keen to, to help out. So that, yeah, that's uh, our vision going forwards and over the next couple of years in the end uh, center, we hope to be yeah, publishing on those screens and dynamics, vaccine payload, um, and then the relationship uh, to formulation across a few academic development projects, as well as industry partners where therapeutic data is known, establishing correlation. And then excitingly, this next page of development in cells and tissues to correlate and really get at the mechanism in our own labs. Um, so that's where we're headed and very grateful to be doing such exciting real world work, um, connecting, yeah, single molecule biophysics up to therapeutic impact. Um, so I hope that that was clear and I took the time to go through the technology and motivation and some of the, the recent results that are coming out of the lab. Um, our main collaborators, I mentioned Peter Hollis group, but we are also on the nanomedicine project. Uh, I mentioned today and Dom, uh, Yao, our joint student, Albert, and Lufay, um, and of course, um, the group in Sweden led by Frederick Cook and uh, Andreas as well as an API there really help us with the surface chemistry um, and some uh, mathematical help from Mark Sutton on confinement theory. Um, yeah, so if there are any questions, I'd be, be happy to take them. I see Gilbert's shown up, so I'm probably at that moment in, in time, but uh, we're very grateful yeah, for Edmund's support and to be rebuilding and, and do this um, impactful uh, biophysics work. Thanks, Dr. Leslie, that's really super. So I'll kick it off. Um, so Dr. Leslie, when I was looking at the um, field of view or the image, and I could identify the different fluorophores wandering around, it looked as if the diameter of the, the image within which the, 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 the uh, fluorophores was migrating was about maybe two couple of microns across or something like that. How small can you make that and still observe uh, the diffusion coefficients of the individual fluorophores? Right. Um, so the size of the field of view depended on the application. Um, when I showed the single sort of ASO RNA interacting small molecules, those wells were a few microns in size. And that, that actually is a very good size. That's kind of a wider well in that sense. I mean, we make wells of all different width, but that, that's a very good size for a long track of either a one nanometer from small molecule or a 50 nanometer particle. And then what we do is we fabricate large arrays of these for, or make serial, serial measurements um, by flowing in the sample and repeating. Um, but we, we also, you said how small of a well so we do also make uh, nano wells where instead of tracking the trajectories, um, we just use the breadth signal for proximity. So uh, a wide array nano wells has this advantage that you're just looking at intensity and the well is then smaller than a pixel. So more recently for very um, quantitative measurements of counting, molecules and the on-off rates or cleavage the nano wells are actually the right way to go so that you asked how small so i guess i'm being literal other uh, yeah we can make them like 50 nanometers or 40 nanometers but if you do that with the confocal microscopy it's the highest signal to noise approach for molecular dynamics and it, the important thing biophysically is we can go up to pretty high concentration like micromolar or more. And that, that's important for the enzyme kinetics. So that, that's the different branch of work in lipid particle work. But but I, I could see that coming in, you know, once we're starting to look at mRNA activity um, a bit later in, in this Endman project. So yeah, we a cool thing is we can fabricate whatever shapes we want, but that those tend to be the, the sizes we use the most around three three micron wide for tracking particles or molecules or nano size for, for interactions at high concentration. And when you were looking at the aggregates 
um, inside um, the collections, I guess you, you, you showed, you showed basically um, images of correlations of, of, of position of, uh, and uh, of and, and motion of um, what I guess were aggregates of the nucleic acids and their conjugate um, ionizable lipids. It was the um, particles and the RNA fusing yeah. together in the wells. Yeah. Right. So, um, so in those cases, if what are you imagining uh, as you increase the loading of a lipid nanoparticle? So that would have been relative that sort of the equivalent of relatively low loading, right? So as you increase, we, look, the, we looked at fusion as a function of loading. And there was the okay. graph that I showed there. Okay. Um, this n over p ratio. So that's just set in formulation when you formulate it. Um, uh -huh. Like acid, you add to the particle. I see. Um, but that does seem to impact their fusion, you know, to each other. So that that would relate to things like storage optimization, or if if you're interested in the biology, you know, the fusion to the endosome, things like that. Um, the the big challenge in the field is that it's so inefficient to deliver, right? It cited to be at three percent or something. So right. We'd be interested in um, understanding um, all the steps towards that, and I think fusion is an important piece. Yeah, and fusion is really important to learn about, and also the release. I was also curious to know um, after you had the loading of these lipid nanoparticles, you did maybe maybe you showed it, but I didn't catch it. And I apologize for that. What was the range? I mean, let's say there was a typical loading. You know, people quote various loading efficiencies of of these nucleic acids. What? Yeah. How does the distribution of loadings look like? Like. What's the standard deviation compared to the mean? Do you, is your sense generically? What What do you have a Do you have a um, feeling for that? Yeah, for the so we we measured that. Um, yeah. So that's a great question. So it depends. So we've. Uh, I mean, this is an example just to kind of uh, show you a graph uh, related mm -hmm. to your question as an example. Yeah. This is the number of loaded uh, labeled siRNA per LNP. Uh, where the average uh, label of uh, siRNA per LMP was like one from the photo bleaching over here. Mm -hmm. And then this is one with a mean of three. So we did check if these are Poisson distributed and it is a fair question for you to think because Poisson distributed is a true in the case of random loading. So if like say they aren't interacting with each other, they go in the particle, they should be Poisson distributed around the mean you know, with the variance related to the mean, which is the, I guess, the basis of your question. So that does look correct here. And then with higher loading, um, you can see that things things got a bit um, broader and we actually weren't entirely sure um, here. Um, and that, there, that is in the discussion of our paper. Uh, it, it, it is possible that there is some interaction with these higher numbers either together between the RNA or the dyes interacting. Um, and then for the mRNA case, I, I didn't show that data because we're taking it now. I showed a kind of illustrated movie with the red particle where the mRNA is all packed in and then we lysed it and the big mRNA appeared just to make the point that it's in there and bigger. But we do estimate the numbers are subunity based on our quick look, but what we want to and there was a paper that came out last fall where people confirmed it is for, for one of the formulation, but we want to report in our, our quantitative way that number distribution for say Moderna and Patro Pfizer. And then there's a main hypothesis, you know, it makes sense from the biophysics that, you know, it, it's probably Poisson distributed around a number less than one uh, right now um, for current conditions. But, but I mean, it also probably depends on a particular sample or particular manufacturing and and that's something we can measure you know quickly right after manufacturing um our preliminary look at that data also shows something kind of peculiar um which i showed peter and he said it wasn't so unreasonable which is that the loading number is changing versus time right after being formulated so they're mixed at acidic ph the mrna and the lipid and then they're held at neutral ph and we're seeing them get bigger and the effective loading number going up so it it could be that with different manufacturing processes, different prep, you know, different locations, that that some of these properties are a bit dynamic. So 
with the discussion of you know RNA centers and fighting the next pandemic and optimization, you know, quality control on those numbers, given that I think they are the, the dynamic, we're probably the only one taking the closest look at that, um, uh, which is fusion really um, is important. But yeah, short answer to your question is I would hope for the mRNA plus on loaded, you know, around a small number and um, or for the mRNA, sorry, for siRNA for low loading, they do come out as plus on loaded around a small number. And larger yeah. numbers might be some self interactions. Great, thank you for that. Um, I see a bit of a detailed question, but it really interests us. It's such a great, great question about you know statistics. <laughs> yeah, statistics are something that you guys can really get a handle on. Um, yeah, I, and I would, interactions I would, influence them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, and that's something to that we'll teach you stuff. May I uh, ask uh, one of the other audience members, Ali? But yeah, Ali, can you turn on your microphone and ask? Or would you like me to read it? I guess either way, but I would like to invite you to ask it yourself if you if you would like to. Uh, it, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, Dr. Leslie, it was a fantastic uh, and great talk. So my question is, uh, as I write it down, uh, it's uh, what's the media when you are uh, taking these uh, uh, movies? I mean, when you are. Uh, you're using the nanoparticles with the cells or the target. Uh, do you usually use just buffer, or uh, the uh, I, or I, 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 the other things I should mention? So, if you want to go to move uh, forward, so uh, in the the real yeah, uh, world, yeah, in the real world, so uh, we have lots of protein and they just interact with the nanoparticles. So. Uh, can you, uh, how can I say, can, uh, can you uh, remove these interfering, I mean, uh, materials or the molecules from the, uh, uh, the nanoparticles? Um, yeah, so I guess just to unpack the question, I mean, here we have used a buffer. Question was, are we using a buffer? I have throughout the slides shown which one. I mean, they're chosen to be uh, relevant to the uh, context. So, um, yeah, but I, I guess this particular one with the vaccine, the T buffer, but we always, yeah, consult with our collaborators on which buffer to use. Um, the second question was maybe asking if the method was compatible with proteins on the particles. And I would say that's one of the good virtues of, of the technique is yes. I mean, I haven't gone too much into details, but these surfaces are coated so that the particles don't stick. And we have worked with particles with, you know, different like ASOs or other molecules on the surface. We've worked with proteins in our devices and some of our other published work. Um, and we just, you know, we just have to optimize the surface so they don't stick if, if we don't want them to stick. You can see this is kind of a new video. Some things are sticking, but, um. Yeah, it's it's completely fine, and I think one of the things in you know we want to do in general is start to take these particles out of cells, or you know, and then actually do I mean the mass spec. Uh, I mean the whole field is interested in you know when a particle enters a cell or different uh, fluids in the body or wherever it is being targeted. You know what what are the proteins? There's a hypothesis that this ApoE protein targets to deliver. There's a hypothesis that different peptides and modifications could lead to particles uh, targeting elsewhere. So I think it's a great question, and yes, and um, I mean, presumably it would just be a small uh, modification to the particle and not affect its structure too much. Presumably that's dominated by the lipid and the nucleic acid. But if you saw it change in shape by that, you would, you would detect that as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Leslie. I have another question. There's a hand up from uh, Dr. L uh, Lava Sanifar. Yes, um, it was a very interesting, uh, great talk. And um, I was wondering, like, is the system and the method adaptable to other molecules, like not just mRNA or siRNA? So, for example, if you have another macromolecule which is at a similar size range, or, and if it is, have you used it? And are there any limitations in terms of physical chemical properties of the molecule that you can look at into their loading into LN, into 
lipid nanoparticles. Yeah, I mean, we we have um, we've started looking at, I guess, two other. My group has sort of three teams, and um, one's looking at different DNA interactions, RNA interactions. The lipid particle project, I guess, is focused on sRNA and mRNA just because um, those are the standards in the field. But we have looked at some photospherics particles. If you're asking about like different kinds of particles um, in the group in Guelph, or uh, we, yeah, we looked at proteins, but yeah, th this is adaptable to any kind of particle. From a technical perspective, when we do, do that or start new projects, we, we need to know the charge and the typical buffer that's relevant, and then we optimize the surfaces. Really, really, it's adaptable to any particle as long as we can surmount those things. But we've gotten pretty good at coding uh, surfaces with multiple layers to avoid, uh, to avoid sticking. That's the only challenge. Okay. And also wanted to know, like, you changed the pH in this case to look at the loading. So is it possible to change, for example, the temperature and or you know, other relevant uh, formulations. Yeah, and yeah. And that. in the intro of the talk, actually, I, I advertised we have a recent paper in nucleic acids research um, on uh, out of equilibrium DNA um, dynamics and by my PhD student, um, Cindy, DNA biophysics team. But um, actually, there we, we use temperature as a tool to take systems out of equilibrium because we're like really curious what the structures are that are governing the dynamics. And so it's an example where temperature change and control is a tool. Um, for all of our kinetics work, we definitely need to know the temperature. I mean, from statistical mechanics or thermodynamics, it can impact things uh, exponentially. So uh, yeah, we <laughs> can control temperature. Um, but yeah, you have to be careful with that. Obviously, you're bending glass and heating things above a objective that costs tens of thousands of dollars. So, you know, <laughs> it's a bit delicate, but, but yes, uh, temperature okay. controlled. And it, it's very possible to do just, you know, one has to do it carefully. Um, and yeah, but if you're curious how we've done it, uh, I guess the supporting information of that NAR has one example, but there's, there's multiple ways to do it. And it's, it's very doable. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I guess perhaps we have to talk later. <laughs> uh, yeah, it sounds like you're interested in something. I mean, um, that's our purpose of being here. Um, yeah, happy to, to chat genuinely. And yeah, we've set up quite a few microscopes and you know, just emerging after the moving pandemic. So it's a really good time. There's uh, if there's one more question that I see uh, at the moment, we have just probably one time for one more, I guess. And it's from Nashmia Zia. Um, Nashmia, I invite you to ask your question. Hi. Uh, so I want to ask, uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Leslie. It was really interesting. Uh, so at the end of the uh, presentation, you said that um, it, there was a, a diagram in which it was mentioned that um, uh, protein expression will be determined. So I want to ask if it will be determined in single cells. Um, or that, that's our plan. Yeah, we are setting up. I mean, this isn't something that we've done yet, but I, I, I can, there's a page, paper in um, like Nature of Communications from 2020 where, so I, I guess I can just say it's been, you know, physically done or people use uh, GFP or other proteins to track expression. But yeah, what we'd like to do, I mean, to kind of connect the dots from single particle characterization up it, it, it does feel important, yeah, to track those particles, how they're localized in the endosome, and then whether they're in the cytosol or there. And then um, as they go out, the, so if you use a gene like cipherase or, or another one like GFP, um, you would see some fluorescence like in the single cell. So um, the idea is to kind of get at those questions of how the size structure and um, encapsulation dynamics under pH change is relevant because as you know, the pH drops in the endome. And then finally expression and, and see if that correlates up to, to what's you know, part of the equation of optimization. Um, 
for, for real vaccine therapeutic developers who are working on a much more macroscopic scale. But yeah, uh, right now we would be working first at the single cells. And I think everyone's curious to see that. I mean, it'd be nice in the field to do more in vitro optimization and maybe have to use mice less. I mean, one, one would think um, that one could make these connections, but at the same time, it's, you know, it's very, very complex. So many things to optimize with that. That is what we'd like to do. I mean, at, at least it will get at the, the biophysics of, of each of these steps and the relation to structure. Yeah. Um, oh, thanks, doctor. Yeah, so we're curious to see what, what happens there, but um, yeah, I hope to report back on that in the next few years. 